I think one beyond that. We're not quite yet where like the company is making a, a revenue, like major majority revenue decision on that has anything to do with crypto. So like Visa and those folks, 99 point very num large number of nines percentage of the revenue is going to be non-crypto related. And for like the boards and the CEOs and the shareholders to, to care about crypto, that has to change. So like these early deployments are start of that, they have to test what works, what doesn't, and where they start getting adoption. And when you start seeing those revenues at least hit 5%, like I think you'll actually start, crypto will, means it hit mainstream. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today we have a special one because last week was BlockWorks premier crypto conference called Permissionless, where I got to meet my co-host Mert for the first time. Uh, no surprise, we got along in person too, but what is a surprise is the guy is yoked. I think he used to be a professional bodybuilder. He's going to have to tell that story on another episode. Uh, we had a lot of fun, met a lot of different Solana builders, including Drift, Drip, and Gito. Um, what was cool is last year, didn't see a whole lot of Solana builders. But this year, you can see the narrative changing for Solana, not only on crypto Twitter, but also in person at these conferences. Uh, during the conference, Anatoly and Mert had a discussion on the state of Solana. They talked about Fire Dancer. And Anatoly gave his five-year plan for Solana. It was the best discussion in the conference, in my opinion. So that'll start playing in the next few seconds. And on Thursday, we're dropping an episode with Ryan Wyatt, who is from... YouTube, where he led gaming for eight years before jumping into Web3 at Polygon Labs. And now he's an advisor at Polygon and he's investing on the side. It's a really fun conversation. So tune on that for Thursday. All right, let's get to the show. This episode is brought to you by Gito. Gito is the easiest way to start earning MEV rewards on Solana through liquid staking. Get your soul, stake it with Gito, and get instant access to liquidity through their liquid staking token, Gito Soul. Get started today at Gito.network slash staking. Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, just uh, we're going to talk about the state of Solana today um, and Tolly's takes on you know what the what's going on in the ecosystem, what we could be doing, um, some of the things that people might not be familiar here. So um, before we get to the serious questions, I want to start with um, probably the most important questions for the success of Solana. I think probably the most important thing or the question to answer is Tolly, like when you're going to shave your head. <laughs> when am I what? Shave my head? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of happening on its own. <laughs> like, I've got three kids now, so like I think within five years. <laughs> all, right, all right. You heard your first five years. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I mean, let's. it's been like a pretty big few weeks for Solana. Um, you know, there's been Visa, there's a the Maker announcement, Shopify, uh, actually MetaMask announcement today as well. Um, can you just maybe walk the audience through like... What, what have you been more excited about um, in the past few weeks about Solana and what they should know about? Yeah, I mean, um, I was really kind of surprised by Rune and, and Maker making the announcement that they're considering Solana as a stack for their own application chain. And that's just awesome because it's not even about Solana, the mainnet or the token or anything like that, but really about open source and the fact that we built all this awesome open source code. And now it can be used by other folks in the Ethereum ecosystem or whatever ecosystem, you know, for whatever purposes they want. And, um, you know, I was a developer that came of age in the 90s. Like, I was a huge fan of Linux and GPL and, like, kind of fighting Microsoft by coding on the weekends. Uh, and it's just awesome to see, like, somebody take my code and use it. It's, just, like, the best feeling in the world. Nice. Yeah. Um, really, I think... People were, you know, probably surprised by that, but you know, the SVM is a really brilliantly engineered piece of machinery. Um, what, what else? How about the Visa announcement? Yeah, Visa is um, like one of those uh, major corporations that does stuff that I feel like crypto can really help. Like my belief is that financial rails should be as cheap as possible. Like it should really, you know, I think of everything, you know, that we're building is almost like. It's like almost like logistics, right? You want your roads as flat as possible to use the least amount of gas for cars. And like none of the stuff actually like creates value for the world. If it's inefficient or there's delays, it adds a tax and, uh, you know, to the real value creators. Like it adds a cost to consumers. It slows the innovation and everything down. And I'm hoping that, you know, as I imagine the world a hundred years in the future, that like all of finance runs on open source, trust minimized compute financial rails and those rails are as cheap as possible because that would minimize the amount of value that it's extracting from the rest of the world. And then 
you end up with just value creators, you know, like a company like Visa that manages fraud and risk and all this other stuff, that's actual value creation. That This is where this should be making money. And the fact that, you know, you have crypto rails that are open source and like easily programmable and, and easy for them to leverage and now cheap and fast, I think is like kind of, I hate the word convergence, but it's the convergence of, of, of everything coming together. And I'm pretty excited about it. I think like, Everyone that I talk to and, you know, myself personally really thinks that stable coins have been like the killer app, right? That crypto has discovered over the last six years. And um, I want to see them, you know, in the hands of a billion people. What is the like visa integration? So that's maybe a higher level, but what does like specifically the integration look like? I think it's something to do with cross-border um, transactions, right? Yeah, these are cross-border transactions. So they're using USDC to settle those. Um, the alternatives for cross-border transactions are, um, you know, beyond my understanding of <laughs> finance requires like many bank transfers and a lot of risk and, and managing that risk between all the counterparties. And uh, with something like USDC on Solana, you know, it takes 400 milliseconds to, to do that transfer and you got settlement guarantees and everything else. So I think there's an uh, obvious win there um, for, for financial and for there. Yeah. Um, so we were talking about value capture or like the fees should be should be low on the kind of so that people can just permissionlessly build stuff on top of it. Um, there's probably like two schools of thoughts on this in, in the crypto world right now, which is, you know, either the fees should be as low as possible um, or maybe the L1 should be, you know, uh, more focused on value capture and then the L2s can kind of um, do the low, low fees. How do you how do you think about that and how like Solana approaches it? Yeah, this, um, you know, like, first of all, if crypto survives because there is a L1 like Ethereum that's able to use like its dynamic base fee adjustment and, and gas metering to maximize returns and actually have a sustainable ecosystem because of that. And that's the only thing that works. It's a miracle, right? Like that would still be a miracle because I think it's, all, it, it's just really, really hard to build systems that are going to survive forever. Um, I just have bigger ambitions than that. Like I want, <laughs> I want like a, a global, like giant state machine that runs many different applications all in one shared system, all with one like atomic settlement guarantees as fast as possible and as cheap as possible. This is, you know, like I spent all my career doing performance optimization. So like that, this is what like gets me excited, you know? So I feel like, in that environment, in a shared environment where you have many applications that are have as many resources as we could possibly provide, you know, physics, uh, you know, if, if physics allow, it has to be as cheap as possible. And I think the way that it accrues value is from the long tail of all these applications in aggregate generating fees. But in my mind, there's no reason why an application isn't the the thing that generates the most revenue, right? And generates the most fees. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure layer in that environment should be as cheap as possible and extract the least amount of value. So I want to talk a bit more about fees. One thing that Solana has that is pretty cool and maybe most people don't know about it is local fee markets. Uh, so the fees don't actually have to be low. Like if there's a hotspot contention yep. for a piece of state, the fees might actually increase depending on the priority fees. Can you talk about just how local fee markets work, what they are, et cetera, and how they differ from other chains? Yeah, this was um, kind of like uh, one of our one of our design bugs that we that we had at launch. And you know, it's kind of funny that like when we launched, we had a mechanism that's not too for that much different from one five five nine. Basically, when we built the system, we kind of estimated that the vast majority of transactions are going to use less compute than it takes to verify a signature. So you can actually very cheaply meter the system by charging per signature, per, crypto, per cryptographic signature in a transaction. And if the capacity of the network drops by 50%, you double fees and you do that every time and you kind of get this exponential increase for fees and eventually you know, the attacker or whatever back off. Um, and that works great until you get uh, DeFi and NFTs on the same system. Because <laughs> what happens is you have an NFT mint. It's, you know, the, the coolest monkey pictures you've ever seen. 
and um, users figure out how to build bot farms that generate insurmountable amounts of traffic. Literally, they submit. We had a, a validator that, that saw about 100 gigabits worth of traffic being submitted uh, to the network. And all of these transactions are all hitting the same spot. And the majority of the work is not done in the layer one processing engine. It's not done in the smart contracts at all. It doesn't even matter how many transactions land. You're spending all your resources just filtering through this data. And um, this is um, a very kind of old school, embarrassingly obvious problem in retrospect. It's a database hotspot problem. You have everyone that wants the exact same state. They will submit as much traffic as they possibly can for that state. And uh, you have to figure out how to um, split that traffic into stuff that that's stuff that's valid and stuff that's no longer valid. And uh, that took, you know, it, it, it took us very quickly to identify the problem, but um, layer one blockchains are very hard to develop for. It's a system that you really, really, really terrified of breaking. So rollout and, and everything else happened last year in pieces. And the kind of solution we came up with is very unique um, because of how Solana's um, C-level virtual machine works. Each transaction actually tells the network what state it's going to read and write. And at the scheduling and kind of like bandwidth filtering level, we're able to separate transactions that want to do the hot NFT mint from the ones that want to do a liquidation, from the ones that want to do payments, and kind of fill up the block in buckets. So you take like the highest priority NFT mints because they're the ones that are paying the highest fees. But as soon as that bucket fills up, you can stop looking at NFT transactions altogether and you just drop them very quickly. And then you move on to the next highest priority thing that could be happening on the chain. Maybe that's an NFT mint um, uh, or a liquidation. And you fill that bucket up. And eventually, you actually fill up the block. And this localization um, isolates hotspots. You can never get rid of hotspots. It doesn't matter if you have a magical zero knowledge singularity based VM that does everything instantly. It doesn't matter if you have a layer two or whatever. If you have a hotspot that everyone wants to access, it's like, you know, imagine everyone in this room wanted to flip a light switch in, in, in this room. You would all rush to the light switch. It doesn't matter how fast you can flip that light, that light switch even. Right? That, that part doesn't matter because there's one person that's going to flip it first and everyone's competing to be that first person. And making sure that there's prioritization to get there is, is kind of like the, the tricky part. So all that work that we did, uh, we actually saw it battle tested uh, a couple of months ago. The folks remember the Mad Lads NFT mint. It you know, was one of the biggest mints uh, of the year. Like The volumes on it um, exceeded even volumes for all NFTs for about a week. Um, and during the mint, uh, Helium was onboarding almost a million hotspots at the same time. So we actually saw isolation in practice. Nothing really, fees, did, fees didn't spike. Uh, we saw the NFT mint pro progress, uh, you know, as, as it should, and not, it had no impact on the, on the Helium migration that was happening concurrently. So that was kind of like... Uh, a year of effort, seeing it battle tested and, and like actually work without bugs, you know, it was like a moment for me, like, oh wow, it, this this stuff actually works and it's good. Um, you, even as an engineer, until you actually see it work in production, you're never certain, you know, like a, especially if you have a complex system. Yeah, that um, I remember. I remember that day we we had to support their um, in infrastructure and whatnot, and it was very. Um, uh, exciting to see both those events happen at the same time. But um, that actually ties in, so local fee markets is just one of the improvements. There's also Quick uh, and then QoS based on Stakeway. Can you maybe talk briefly about those as well? Yeah, those are uh, those other components are there to, to make sure that, you know, they're part of the implementation package kind of local fee markets. So the reason why we needed Quick is because Solana doesn't have a mempool. You know, we try to propagate data as fast as possible. And you need some way to limit that traffic. We were using UDP before, and that meant that bots or you know users, whatever whoever you want to call them, they could generate as much traffic as they wanted to. And in some cases, we literally did see uh, it spike to 100 gigabits, which uh, a lot of folks these days used to consider a di distributed denial of service. I think these days it's probably not not. <laughs> um, so Quick allows you to limit traffic that that's hitting all the nodes. Um, the second challenge after you do that is like, well, what if the attacker generates a lot of Sybil nodes 
that sent a little bit of traffic at a time. And this is where you have to start shaping and classifying traffic. And the only way to do that in a permissionless network is to use some kind of wait, waiting factor. And the easiest one to use is stake. So you can basically give quality of service guarantees for stake. And this is a different concept from prioritization. If you have half of a percent of stake or whatever, some very small percentage of the stake, what quality of service does is it guarantees that all the rest of the nodes, staked or unstaked, cannot saturate the, your chan the channel to the other block producers such that you cannot send a message through. Right? So if you have the smallest amount of stake, you should still be able to get that you know, weighted percentage amount of traffic through to the leader. So that, that's the quality of service guarantee. So that's kind of the improvements that have been made in the past year. But there's obviously, you know, we're always kind of trying to ship more. Probably the most exciting thing coming up is FireDancer. Um, can you talk a bit about FireDancer, what it is, and, you know, the team behind it and what's going to enable? Yeah, um, you know, like I think one, the, the thing that I'm the most jealous of the Ethereum ecosystem of is the fact that there's multiple client implementations of the, of the software. And this is really, really critical, I think, for any decentralized system to achieve because reality is that like software is written by humans. You know, the best of us still make mistakes and those mistakes could be catastrophic. And really the only way to defend against them is to have two separate teams building, you know, off from a common spec, hopefully in separate tools with separate technology stacks. And then the probability of, you know, two of these efforts to have the exact same bug in the exact same place with the same behavior uh, becomes lower and lower, you know, virtually zero, you know. So ideally, you have four clients like Ethereum, but the, f the second client is the hardest one to build because that's the kind of, you have to do the hard work of defining the spec and nailing all the interfaces down and really making sure that everything's uh, well-defined such that another team can go and re-implement it. So this other team is actually um, a bunch of high-frequency trading folks out of Jump. Um, they're performance geeks like me. You know, we can we can recite all the instructions in x86. <laughs> uh, so like um, these are folks that have built systems that handle you know terabits worth of data for trading. So they really understand uh, the kind of optimizations that you need to make to make a high-performance system. Um, so what's cool is that they get to see the problem from the start and the end of the maze. We kind of had to build Solana, you know, build the, the jet engine as we're flying it. And uh, that iteration process is, is really, really hard to do because we have to ship code. We have to like respond to bugs or performance issues in the network. Um, but we also have to design it, you know, sometimes on the fly. Um, with them looking at the start at the end, they actually see what all the features and, and optimizations that we've done, and they can lay out the software almost in a perfect way to scale across hardware. So I really like, if you're like a C developer that loves hyper-scalable systems that really utilize every core, uh, go look at their code. They have a, kind of this beautiful architecture with, uh, with like a, effectively its own OS that can assign different parts to different cores across the, the chip with shared memory between them. Um, it almost never doesn't, uh, it basically never does an allocation, never calls malloc. Um, so like everything runs as fast as possible with no inter interrupts. Um, so they can demonstrate so far the components that they've built, not integrated into one client, but each component that they've built uh, exceeding over 10 gigabits worth of traffic. Um, and this is, we're not talking about like mainframes here. These are like, you know, take some four, four cores in a modern day Intel machine to hit, um, you know, 10 gigabits worth of traffic on, on like quick and signature verification and stuff like that. So in a very, you know, like common system that already runs Solana, their software improvements will probably show 10x improvement in performance and the exact same system. So the benefit of that is that Hardware requirements could drop. That means Solana nodes are going to get cheaper, right? That, that's one benefit. The other benefit is that we have a second client. And the third benefit is if there is like really strong demand for capacity, you can actually run FireDancer as the primary client. And then 
the secondary client, Solana, could just verify already committed, ve validated, verified blocks and to give you that guarantee that safety is correct. And that latter part is much, much easier to optimize. It means that we kind of have a very small thing that we need to make the labs client be really, really good at or, or match performance of Fire Dancer. So um, it's, I think, like one of the most important things that the ecosystem is working on. I'm, I'm really excited about the progress and like um, about the performance too. You know, 10 gigabits is like a million TPS. That's a lot. <laughs> There's obviously going to take a lot more from going from a lab uh, performance number that you achieve in a laboratory with perfect network setup and stuff like that to, to live internet. But like once you see it working, everything else is kind of just, uh, it's just a job. You can get it done, right? Like you can fix all the, all the other problems after that. So, um, I mean, it seems like the main benefits are one security, right, in case of a day zero attack, and there's multiple implementations, and it's in a different language, it's in C instead of uh, Rust. And, and so, um, and then obviously better performance, um, and, and actually the most interesting part is probably kind of lower hardware requirements. Um, that's a very common critique of Solana, so I just want to maybe take a second to talk about that. A lot of people kind of, um, or at least on Twitter, let's say, not, not in person, but we'll say, uh, you know, Solana, all they've done is increase the hardware requirements. Um, like, and, and how would you respond to that? Like, what do they get wrong about Solana when they say that? Um, so, like, people, some, some people assume that it does take a mainframe to run Solana. Um, they also assume that because the hardware requirements are high, that most of the nodes are in AWS, which is funny. <laughs> so, like, the, the biggest real bottleneck in all these systems, even if we had perfect implementations, is bandwidth. It's actually egress bandwidth that each, each node sends out. And like um, the way that bandwidth is distributed across the network is the more stake you have, the more work your node does. You get more rewards because of that, but you actually have to pay for more egress bandwidth. And like a, a fairly high stake node right now is probably going to generate about 200 terabytes worth of bandwidth a month. Um, on AWS, that's going to be pretty expensive. Uh, I don't know what the current price is, but it could be in the thousands. On a, in a modern day data center, you get 64 cents per terabyte, so it's like 150 bucks. And the total cost of a node, like in Latitude SH, is like 350 a month to run a Solana node. Uh, and if you have like, if you're lucky like me and you got like fiber to your home, you can run a Solana node at home if you wanted to. Um, and the hardware requirements after that, I would say the biggest factor is RAM. Um, I think in 114 and, and pro so current release and, and prior, we recommend like 256 gigabytes of RAM, but uh, a lot of improvements have been done in the last release and we see validators run in steady state under 48 gigs of RAM. So like just, you know, we did a lot of memory crimes in the in the original implementation, and it takes a while to to go fix all of those. Mm -hmm. But they're slow, slowly getting knocked down. Design wise, like the way Solana is designed, you you in theory never really need more resources than a single block of, worth of resources to to process. Um, that's a a big theoretical limit uh, because there's a lot of other stuff that happens. Uh, when you're dealing with forks and snapshot generation and stuff like that, that's really tricky to fit in, in a very small amount of RAM. But um, for like pure verification, you, you might be able to, to get under there. Cool. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the infrastructure aspect of Solana. Let's now talk about apps and the things being built on top of Solana. So obviously Visa um, just a, a very interesting announcement, very exciting. Uh, so Solana seems to be maybe emerging as kind of a payments hub as well. Um, what are you most excited about? Like, w which of these verticals? Uh, can you talk maybe a bit more about payments? You know, t teams like TipLink, Otter, um, Solana Pay, Shopify integration, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, there's like kind of like the, like crypto still in, in its kind of nascent days, I would say. Like when I worked at a big company, like Qualcomm, there were like innovation teams that are always trying to go build stuff out. And I would say we're still like, we're like a little bit, I think, one beyond that. We're not quite yet where like the company is making a, a revenue, like major majority revenue decision on that has anything to do with crypto. So like Visa and those folks, but, 99 point, very num large number of nines percentage of the revenue is going to be non-crypto related. 
and for like the boards and the CEOs and the shareholders to, to care about crypto, that has to change. So like these early deployments are start of that, they have to test what works, what doesn't, and where they start getting adoption. And when you start seeing those revenues at least hit 5%, like I think you'll actually start, crypto will, means it hit mainstream. So we need to get there. Um, and I'm really excited about these early starts because they're coming from relevant companies. Like payments is an obvious use case where crypto should shine. And like Visa is like one of the best companies to, to go execute on that. And um, what's cool is they're just leveraging USDC. It already works. It's already a great digital dollar. So they don't have to build everything from scratch. And like um, they can go fast to the consumer and actually see where they're seeing traction. Um, so that's, that, that to me is pretty exciting. Um, and like from that kind of like bigger companies like Circle and, and like Visa that generate these bigger infra things, you have a whole long tail of startups like Tiplink, Otter and like code that, that build awesome, great payments apps that, you know, folks can use and, and like start using every day. Uh, but we still haven't seen like, you know, like four years ago, I was talking to folks like, okay, the Venmo of crypto is right around the corner. We still haven't seen that breakout application, but um, I'm, you know, we're going to keep grinding until it happens. Mm-hmm. One, one thing that, um, so, I maybe have a slightly different take on this. Actually, I think my favorite application in crypto so far just ever is Helium uh, and these deep-end networks and how they kind of um, allow permissionless P2P networks, uh, but also tie in crypto with the physical world. Um, and obviously, Helium migrated to Solana from um, uh, just their own blockchain. Renders doing the same thing, and we have teams like HiveMapper um, also doing decentralized mapping. Can you maybe talk a bit more more about like Deepin and like how Solana enables Deepin um, efficiently? Yeah, Deepin is uh, these like de- decentralized physical inf- infrastructure networks. And these are really, really cool because they are like, I think a perfect uh, application of using like crypto economics to incentivize rollout of co- complex physical infrastructure in the real world. Um, the Helium is, is like the easiest one to explain. So they launched a MVNO, which is a virtual mobile carrier. It's kind of like, um, you know, a business where you borrow band, like borrow bandwidth and coverage from another company like T-Mobile, and then you can sell your own plans. But what's really, really cool is that they know exactly where every user that's using T-Mobile in the Miami area is actually like using data the, the, the most. So they know exactly where they're paying T-Mobile the, the highest amount for data. And they can change the incentivization on the Helium network to increase the rewards in that, in that spot. And users will go deploy hotspots, which will then now serve data instead. So it kind of is like the perfect way to use crypto. You have rich data environment that shows you exactly where you need hardware. You have crypto economics you know, for tokens that to incentivize people to go do it. And you don't have to own any of the hardware or any of the logistics or go f- to go figure out where do I stick this like 5G cellular antenna? Like Verizon doesn't have this ability. They have to go get like massive amounts of like overhead to go deploy any, any piece of hardware. And this is all self-serve and, and uh, really, really cool. So to me, like I hope by next year, like Helium is nationally rolled out and we're seeing, you know, tens of millions of US users get the benefit of like a $5 data plan. Um, which would be, I think, really, really awesome. So super excited for them, really gunning for them to win. Um, Hive Mapper is another example that, that's really, really clever. Um, they're using um, basically drivers that already drive for DoorDash or, you know, like uh, Uber or, or Lyft. They stick cameras on their cars and start collecting street view data. And because these are folks that are constantly driving, unlike a Google Street View car, they actually see 200 times faster updates for their data in, in Hive Mapper, and um, there's about 60 million kilometers of road in the world, and I think they're about to hit 8% of global road coverage with just about a thousand drivers, um, and that's a uh, probably the coolest you know AI intersecting crypto startup in the world because like all this data is being used to to train models and um, like create signals with ML. Hey everyone, quick break to tell you about Cheeto. Cheeto is the number one liquid staking provider in Solana. 
Gino's been known for the MEV software, and now they're the fastest growing liquid staking provider in the Solana ecosystem. Solana DeFi summer is heating up, and what asset do you want to use in DeFi? Liquid staking tokens. Why? Because with Gito, you can take your soul, stake it, and get instant access to liquidity through their liquid staking token, Gito Soul. You can then use Gito Soul throughout the Solana DeFi ecosystem while earning yields through MEV rewards and staking rewards with Gito. And Gito makes staking super simple. You can take your soul, stake it, get instant liquidity, and start earning rewards all within three clicks. And not only do they make it simple, they make it secure. Gito has seven audits, they have more than a million souls staked, and they're one of the most respected teams in all of DeFi. Geo is for whales who need deep liquidity. It's also for people like me and you who just want to get started with liquid staking. You have your soul, why not stake it, earn some yield, and start dabbling in Solana DeFi. So go get started today. Check them out at gito.network slash staking. That's gito.network slash staking. I'll put a link in the show notes. Use the link so they know that I sent you. And go get started today. One thing I want to ask, I mean, there's a lot of EVM uh, and Ethereum folks here in They've been around for a long time and kind of set the way for Solana. What, what do you think? Um, what, what are some things that you think the Solana community and ecosystem can take away from Ethereum community and ecosystem, and maybe vice versa as well? Like, what do you think maybe Ethereum ecosystem can take away from Solana? Um, I think like the the best parts of the Ethereum community, are the ones that are really focused on open source development, uh, trust min minimization, and uh, research and development, like folks that go out of their way and write really deep, insightful papers and, and really explain what they're doing and then publish open source code. I mean, there's countless of these examples. Uh, and that's something that has been, like I think, a gift to the broader crypto community. I don't think Solana would be here if it wasn't for all the kind of free R&D that we're, we're getting out of all the Ethereum researchers. Even if we don't adopt those ideas, we can read them, understand them, see what problem they're solving, and that you know gets the engineering juices going. And what do you think maybe something that um, you think Solana has that's like a great component that maybe Ethereum can take away? Um, I think uh, folks in the Ethereum community that I talk to at least are paying attention to what Solana's doing. And like one, there's just, if, if you are gonna launch an app chain, go fork Solana, we'll help you. Go take it, <laughs> it'll be your problem. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely help you. It doesn't need to accrue any value to the network of the token. It's really just kind of, I think, for the, for the open source vibes. It's an awesome thing to do. Um, and so that, that's like one simple practical thing. But the other one I think is like, um, we've solved some really interesting challenges. The way that SVM is designed, it's not as uh, expensive to grow state in, in the virtual machine. We don't run into the exact same bottlenecks as the EVM does. So we've done tests where we've had uh, internal networks run with like 15 billion accounts and snapshots get to about 700 gigabytes and there's no hit to performance or finality or anything else. Like every, all, everything else still, still has awesome performance and, and RAM stays under like 48 gigs. So those improvements, you don't have to like copy SVM but you can see what we fix and what's different and then go apply them to VM and like that'll just accelerate, you know, everything will get better adoption will, will accelerate and like the, you know, the pie will grow. So um, just maybe two more final questions before the time is up. Um, wh one thing I'm interested in is obviously you have a great technical vision when it comes to Solana um, as, a, as a CEO of Solana Labs. What do you hope or what, do you, what, what is the ideal state of what Solana looks like in five years? Um, five years is a great question because it's like a reasonable time frame. Um, I think I would love to see like us land, from a technical perspective, multiple leaders uh, per slot. And this is something that is very different roadmap from, I think, all the other blockchains. What I really, really care about is this idea that when I submit a transaction that my rights are not, are basically as fair as possible. So if I have a validator with like 0.001% of stake, I get 0.001% of bandwidth, I can submit my transaction, I have quality of service guarantees, and then my priority, my prioritization actually is applied and I get into the block in a fair way. And then I receive the, the data as fast as possible. And to have those guarantees, we actually need competition at the same time for block producers. And something that we've been working on internally, design-wise, is to support multiple uh, leaders per slot. Um, this is kind of a, you can probably do this in other systems, but it's much easier to do with proof of history. For, uh, so like, 
it's kind of a unique Solana thing, and it's almost like going from TDMA to CDMA. It's kind of funny, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a radio nerd. So like, it's cool to see like, kind of those analogies now happen in, in, in what I'm working on now in, in crypto. Um, but if you have multiple block producers, it means that me as a client, I can send to the geographically closest one. And this is really, really important because the ultimate end state of Solana is you have this massively synchronized as fast as possible, as fast as physics allow state machine. If I am in Singapore and some like crazy market event happens that's gonna move, you know, change everything about you know, the world's finance, that news, travel, that news has to travel speed of light through fiber to a Bloomberg terminal in New York. Uh, at the same time, I want a state transition, that transaction, to go from Singapore to the closest block producer. And if there's more of them, randomly you'll get geographically closer. Because as soon as it, it hits that block producer and starts propagating around the world, it's now moving at the same speed as the news. So by the time that Bloomberg terminal guy looks at the you know, prices on New York Stock Exchange or a market like you know, Phoenix on Solana, that they're exactly the same. There's no arbitrage. It means that a bunch of volunteers running open source software on like random hardware around the world can actually get price discovery and like information, you know, sync to be as good as these major exchanges. And I think that's a huge win for finance, a huge win for the entire space. And this is kind of what I've been working on. It's my dream. <laughs> All right. So if we need multiple leaders per slot. It's kind of like the, the big engineering challenge I think that I'd love to solve in the next five years. Hopefully in the next year, but like, We'll, we'll yeah, give we'll, it, yeah, we'll give, we'll give it some, uh, some slack. <laughs> All right, um, so final question is, um, what do you just, you know, Solana's probably one of the most misunderstood uh, ecosystems, I would say, in the past year, maybe year and a half. What do, you, what do you think is, like, one thing that you hope people would take away from Solana just after leaving this conference? Um, it's just a bunch of open source software, so you don't have to fear it. <laughs> uh, there's a hackathon happening right now, so if you want to build your first Solana app, just go join the hackathon. There's like a good, in, like, good energy of people that will all help each other, so it's kind of the easiest time to start, because you can get help quickly, you can get you know, all the docs for setting up a Helium, uh, read APIs for, uh, for your app are, are all available, so go do it. All right. Well, thank you for listening, everybody, and uh, thank you totally for, for your thoughts. Awesome. Thank you.